It makes me feel like Gene Levy smoking a cigar. Cheers. Cheers, little buddy. To the ace. To ace. Let me ask you a question. When you were growing up, did you realize that your dad was an iconic architect at the time? Um, all this seemed normal to me. What's interesting about us growing up together is that you lived in a Gene Lee house and um, we were friends and hung out at each other's houses and these houses seemed normal to us. I mean, it was because of your dad that I became an architect. And I was getting this education without even knowing it. I mean, it wasn't just that your dad designed the house that you grew up in, he designed pretty much everything in Winter Haven. Driving in the car with Gene Lady, there was always the route that he would take would be to drive by all his buildings, even if it was a little bit out of the way. He would, he would treat them like children. He would go check on them and drive by them, and that would be the route he would take wherever he was going. But isn't it wild that even as fifth or sixth graders, we were conversant in architecture? Paul Rudolph yeah. and that whole crew. I mean, that was that education that just kind of happened. We were exposed to a lot of different things. We were treated like adults. There was always a constant flow of interesting people through these houses. It stimulated conversation. And as a kid, I was treated just like an adult. I was part of the conversation. I wasn't ever told to go to my room or felt normal. But one thing about these houses is, as a child growing up is I had a sense of my own privacy mm -hmm. and my own independence, but yet I was still connected to my family, you know. And so my room was across the courtyard and it gave me my own freedom to access, to have friends over without going through to see my parents and all that stuff. And so I was given independence, you know, and responsibility. Even as I was older, there were a lot of cocktail parties here. Um, you could pretty much come to the, this house at 12 o'clock at midnight and someone would be up. And uh, my dad was a night owl and, and liked to stay up all night. He definitely enjoyed life. Smell the flowers, as he would say. Certainly smoking was one of his things. They smoked three to four or five cigars a day. We definitely wiped a lot of nicotine off the walls and the glass and the ceiling. We couldn't get it off the concrete block, so it's a little different color than the outside block. I just, I, I hope the house still retains that slight scent of tobacco. You know, we were talking about this house. It's gone through a lot of different eras and it's adapted with the times. Even with the original design of the house and today, I mean, what you've done to this house is appropriate. It's modernized it. It's kept the same feel than, than the original house. And there's some things in here I think you would have definitely done. I think in what we wanted to do was not take the house and restore it just to be a dusty old museum. I don't think that's what a living thing is. No, because your dad was always tinkering with the house. He expanded this, that, added this courtyard wall, that courtyard wall. I know he wanted to do a pool in that courtyard, but it didn't happen. So I was happy that we had an opportunity after Hurricane Irma to put this pool in here. I kind of like this cigar thing. It's not very popular, <laughs> especially with the wives, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Let's go inside. I, I, want, I want you to see if it, uh, if it does still smell a little bit like cigar smoke. And I want to show you something inside. Okay. Max, you gotta stop and look at this for a second. Come here, come here. This is what Jane Lady would do. Drink, take a sip of a scotch. Gotta do the teeth like that. And you beg, little buddy, goddamn masterpiece. Look at this thing. It is a goddamn masterpiece. That's why I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, show me what you're gonna show me. You know, this house really, the outside comes in and the inside come, goes in, you know? Two fingers. The original door, it's the same BB hole in there. Did you shoot that? Probably. All right, so check this out. This is the 1956, right? Original version of the house. And this is how it's been expanded, right? So this is currently. Now, where was your bedroom originally? Hmm. Well, this was my original bedroom where we were standing. Where we were standing? Yeah, this was... Um, like how old were you in this, in this space? Maybe until eight or 10 or something like that. Did it seem bigger? It seemed huge. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I started off here. I think this is where the, the babies start, the kids. Right. And then later I moved to the room next door. And then as my sister went to college, I eventually made it out across the terrace, which was freedom. And here you're all protected and oh, cool. part of what's going on. Well. Your bedroom, your former bedroom here, is going to become a museum room. 
This is gonna be the place for people to learn about the house and how it grew from that house over to this house. We're gonna put some more stuff on the walls. The thought is this is gonna be where we kind of tell the story of the house. Jean Leedy is an icon of Florida modernism and a prominent figure in the mid-century movement known as the Sarasota School of Architecture. In fact, Jean Leedy is credited with introducing the name Sarasota School that came to define the movement. Practicality underpinned the architecture scene that unfolded in Sarasota in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. As the Sarasota School of Architecture movement was taking shape upon the shifting sands and unforgiving summers of Florida's Gulf Coast, Ralph Twitchell, Paul Rudolph, and a band of 20-something architects were redefining how to live by the water in America's subtropics. According to them, the prevailing style of Mediterranean revival architecture had no place here. Instead, a new approach of building light and building smart took hold. Their specific responses to the site and climate contributed to a progressive new era in American architecture. Today, the Sarasota School movement is internationally recognized as a high point of regional modernist architecture. In 1954, the young Gene Leedy set off on his own and moved his architectural practice from Sarasota to Winter Haven, a laid-back central Florida town known for its citrus trees and beautiful lakes. There, in the middle of a grapefruit grove, he designed a community of small modern houses for a real estate developer. One of those homes, Gene Leedy kept for himself. It remained his home for more than 60 years until his passing in 2018. But it was more than a home. It was an ongoing design laboratory. Over those six decades, the home evolved as the Leedy family evolved. Courtyards were added, new wings appeared, yet the home always retained its original spirit. I am in awe of this exceptional little house. It packs some powerful lessons. Although the original Sarasota School movement ended over 50 years ago, it continues to be the greatest influence upon me and the work of my firm as we strive to incorporate these concepts and adapt them for an ever-changing world. Max, you had the extraordinary opportunity to grow up in a Jean Leedy designed home and you spent much of your childhood around other buildings and structures that Jean had designed. He has been teaching you how to be an architect from your earliest days. Can you share a little bit about what you learned from Jean early on? I think you're right. I mean, I was getting this architectural education without even knowing. I had the good fortune of spending a lot of time in this house because Jean's family and our family were close friends. And I remember as a kid being over here and this house seemed enormous to me. And this is a small house, right? I mean, it lives big, but it's a small house. But that sense of scale and perspective from a three-year-old or four-year-old or five-year-old, it's wild. I think of all of Gene's projects, it's just got the best human scale. What's your earliest memory of this space? Or is there a particular moment or corner or vision you have in your head? I think my first memory here is actually in the courtyard. I remember those courtyard pavers and the walls and the concrete, the grass growing between them. And growing up in Winter Haven, where Gene Leedy designed damn near the entire town, his architecture was normal. It wasn't extraordinary because I didn't have anything to reference it. Growing up in Winter Haven, being surrounded by quality architecture, not even recognizing it until you kind of moved away. Even beyond three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old perspective, I became best friends with uh, Gene's son Ingram into junior high and high school and college. So I spent a lot of time over here at different phases of my life. Just those nooks and crannies and built-in shelves and drawers and this and that. The house was designed almost like a boat. Every space had to be used to the max because it was so small, but yet it felt so big. The lessons in there is that you can live very well in a small amount of space that's designed right. And in this house particularly, the lessons are these courtyards. You know, these courtyards, I think Gene coined it as wide open privacy. 
He walked around naked all the time. It's you felt secure even though you have walls of glass because of those courtyard walls. As Gene's career evolved, he was always wanting to experiment with bolder materials that could span longer. So he got into these prefabricated, pre-stressed concrete double T's that could span 60, 70 feet. So the house I grew up in, it was a three-story courtyard house and it had you know exposed block like you see here, walls of glass like you see here. When he switched to concrete as the structural system for the house instead of wood, the scale jumped tremendously. I said before, I think this house has a much more, more human scale to it. And the house that I grew up in, even though it was pretty big size, it had those nooks and crannies that you're referencing. It can have this monumental feel, it can feel very grand, but it is human scaled and it has these moments of intimacy. How did Gene design those moments of intimacy that you as a small child could find? You know, it wasn't daunting. This, the house was large, but it didn't feel. There was a place for you in it. Even though we had this robust structural system, he would always offset the materials. Even in this house, he might offset a wood frame of a door meets a wall. There's a little reveal, a little mm -hmm. offset. Uh, that still happens in the larger homes, but it might be a foot offset between one structural member and the other with a piece of glass. And that's where I remember as a kid, just kind of sitting in these nooks and crannies, looking out of glass, seeing a wasp nest go through all of its phases. I think people would come to that house and just think of it initially as a very cold house, but it wasn't. It was, it, it was very warm because of that sense of scale that he had. Is there a project that you've done that you feel is most informed by the lessons at Leedy? Rock, Rock House. Yeah, that was the house that um, I designed for my family in Coconut Grove. It's the structural expression of that house that is directly from growing up in the Leedy house. With that structural expression, that clarity of purpose of the architecture. And you'll see that in the Rock House it was this exposed structural system. Those lessons were powerful and they carry through in the Rock House. What about your kids' experience growing up in the Rock House? You know, they've discussed that they have their own little nooks and crannies and their own little memories. And I think it's that upstairs deck that the Rock House was kind of floating in the treetops. I think as time goes by and memories kind of swirl around, they're interesting. I really want to hear from them more about what was the most profound little spaces for them. There's such a great humanism to your architecture, your sensibility, and to Jean's, and you know, being surrounded by some of his books here, you know, he's deeply sort of politically engaged, engaged with sort of the history of humanity. I mean, the, the books reveal the sort of social dimension of architecture and the sort of, it's not just about shaping space, it's really about how do human beings want to live in the world? How do we want to organize ourselves? How do we want to interact with each other? Can you talk a little bit about, with your practice, What's important to you about why architecture matters? Architecture is front and center in everybody's life, whether they like it or not, and whether they recognize it or not. Well-designed, well-thought-out spaces, they can change your mood, they can change your health, they can change your life. I had the good fortune to just absorb these types of spaces and the influences of architecture and how it can affect other people's lives. And most of what we do is residential. I get a lot of pleasure just kind of through the design process of seeing how families engaging with the families that are gonna live in those homes. They don't know what's coming a lot of times. That's one of the most rewarding parts about what we do is we're creating homes. You acquired this house in a quite different stage, and you knew the house very well from growing up, but what did you learn, maybe structurally, because maybe that's something you weren't paying attention to as a kid, in the process of, I guess, rehabbing, which might be the better word to use, the house? What did you learn about how Leedy designed through that process? The simplicity of the house. It has a structure that's very obvious, and you painted it white to make sure everybody knew that structural system is different from the enclosure system, which is mostly glass and a little bit of block. So he kind of separated those two from each other. This is a work of architecture, and the art in this house is just the spatial sequence from inside to out, how this concrete wall here behind you just flows from inside to out. It pulls you outside. Um, the house was in bad shape when we started to restore it, but then when Hurricane Irma hit, that really was a defining moment for this house. You know, the eye passed directly over this house. Mm -hmm. I came over the next morning. I wasn't sure what I was going to find here. 
outside, it was, it was mayhem. Um, a lot of concrete block walls uh, collapsed. Every single oak tree came down. It was a mess. Was there a moment where the sort of thing that wasn't possible before that's now possible and sort of transformed the way you thought about your design? We want to be grounded in the lessons of this generation of modernism. And modernism is not a style, it's an approach to life, and it's an approach to problem solving and all that. I like to think that I take that rigor mm -hmm. into every single project that we approach. But it comes back to that clarity of purpose and just being authentic. We're not trying to create something that we have to hide all the structure with. We want to expose it and we want to celebrate it. You know, as far as new materials, we want to be sustainable. We want to choose the right materials that kind of recognize the impact that buildings and houses have on our planet. It's big, you know, 40% of carbon emissions are from buildings, right? So. Architects have a, have a role to play in, in the solution. And it's not all bells and whistles like solar panels and gizmos like that. It's, I think it, the root is in the passive design of the house. Especially in Florida, you have to have houses that have deep overhangs and shade the glass and cross ventilation and daylighting. Those are the easy things. You should be doing those things before you do all this other stuff to make a home sustainable. What's your process in terms of what you might employ when you encounter a site? Uh, our architecture is very site-driven and climate-driven. We try not to go in with a style in mind or a look in mind. We explore what the site has to offer, be it views or privacy or sun orientation, all that stuff. And in the process of design, cool things happen. That's where the aesthetic of the house usually starts to evolve and appear. In Florida and in the tropics and subtropics, I think that there's an advantage we have because we need those big overhangs and those shaded places, and that can create a lot of depth to the architecture. So I think some of the more fascinating architecture you see is in the, the tropics and the subtropics. When you view our work, you see a lot of attention that we give to using local materials. Mm -hmm. I love using natural materials. In Florida, especially, we have some great stone and rock. In the Florida Keys, you have keystone with all the fossils in it, you know, brain coral, star coral. You move up the coast a little bit, you have a rock called oolite. It's oolitic limestone, and it's a great rock. You move further up the coast, you get cap rock, you go up to Jacksonville, you get Kakina rock. And I think that instead of importing all these materials from God knows where, let's use what we have here. That's what grounds architecture to a place. I really strive to use local materials in all of our projects because then it's very apparent that, oh, that, that project belongs in that place. I would say one of our most fragile ecosystems in Florida is the Florida Keys. But we worked on a project there that was kind of straddling this hardwood hammock. For me, that was a very fun project to get into that, you know, very site-specific response because one half of the house was very oriented towards the forest, right? And took in cues of the forest and used more wood on that side. And then on the other side of the house, it was all about the Atlantic Ocean and the views and the coral reef that it sits on. So. For sure, we use the keystone fossilized reef material in building the house. I think that's one example of how you can get into the geology of the site and have it inform the architecture. What are the lessons that we can learn from what Leedy did here? He really understood family, family dynamics, and how you know the flexibility and the modularity. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so this house was designed on a four-foot module. He would take his drafting board and put out a big piece of paper, and the first thing he would do was draw a grid of four feet. And then he would overlay a structural system on that. In this house, it's every 16 feet. So every four modules, there's a column. And that are these white columns that are all around us. And then he would align the walls and the perimeter to that as well. And then the roofing would fit within that module. The wood cladding for interior and exterior fit with that module. It was a very efficient way to build. But it was also a very efficient way to expand, too. So this house started off at 1,100 square feet. And over time, with a growing family, the house could kind of grow as well. Part of the intimacy, monumentality, that sort of paradox that's embedded here has to do with the sort of flexibility of spaces with the sliding doors and opening and closing. You can constantly reshape, reframe space and allow the entire home to function as a sort of machine to modulate the environment. Can you talk a little bit about how Leedy designed that and how you use those principles in your work? 
So this house was built before air condition, so it had to breathe, right? You had to have cross ventilation. When air condition slowly came on, the house, you know, did start to incorporate it, but it's kind of more fun to pretend there's no AC here and open those sliders all the time. These were the first uh, sliding glass doors in Central Florida. So there's a nice little asterisk that kind of comes with this house. So it was very progressive. It was radical at the time to have these moving walls of glass. By today's standards though, you're not allowed to use this much glass in a home. The energy codes have kind of kicked in where they don't want to see that much glass, which is kind of the hard part because we want to encourage people to have a lot of glass and a lot of cross ventilation. But it is the glass that's the secret for having such a small footprint feel like it's a much more spacious house. The Jean Leedy influence upon Max Strang has indeed been profound. Strang's firm, internationally recognized for its sustainable mindset, carries on the critical regional modernist ethos characteristic of the Sarasota School architects. Upon Jean's passing, Max spearheaded the rehabilitation of the home as supporters rallied for the creation of a new National Historic District focused on this radical new neighborhood. With the Jean Leedy House as the heart and soul of this district, the home is now poised to influence new generations with its impactful lessons. Cigars. There, there might be something kind of, to that. Kind of your thing, is it? <laughs> All right. Let's, let's go.